Tory MPs, including ministers, are deeply depressed at the moment about their prospects. Simon Clark, the former cabinet minister and anti-Sunak rebel, this afternoon tweeted the single word, iceberg. Back in January, he'd made himself unpopular by arguing that the Tories under the current Prime Minister are heading for a shattering defeat. He responded to his critics with a titanic reference by saying, no one likes the guy shouting iceberg. So how close is that iceberg now? I'm joined by Lord Frost, another senior Conservative, no great friend of the current regime, I should think uh, it's fair to say Lord Frost. So how close is the iceberg? Well, it depends what you think um, Simon Clark meant by iceberg. But for me, it means the election. And obviously, the election is getting closer every month. Who knows when it's going to come? And the polls are getting worse and worse for reasons we can go into. So, yeah, it's worrying. There seems to be an extraordinary lack of sort of political nous at the moment. As I said right at the top of the show, there is good economic news. There's lots of things the government could, could talk about. They could talk about the huge amount of money they've made available for some kind of personal tax cuts since the autumn. Uh, you know, they've just had the budget and yet they decided to make this extremism weak and then the Frank Hester Row has blown that to pieces. Do you think they're just simply not very good at politics? I think they could be better at politics. I think that's clear after the last week or two. But this often happens to governments who are in a different position, difficult position in the election. You know, things start to go wrong. You can't impose your story on what's happening. Um, everything kind of turns against you. And I think that's a little bit what we're, we're seeing. We can't get the good news through, such as there is, and the bad news swamps it. You've you've been arguing in the Telegraph over the last few weeks and months that this is not a properly conservative government, and that you think there should be it should be more conservative, and indeed that Rishi Sunak isn't conservative enough. Mm. What do you mean when you say he's not enough of a conservative? So I think I mean the, the political problem we've got is that nearly two thirds of the people who voted for us in 2019 are now not going to vote for us, and some are going to Labour and some are going to Reform, but most of us are most of them are simply sitting on their Hands. To be clear, that's two thirds of the people who voted for you for the first time in 2019, not the total number. No, the total, the of total, the total number. number. It depends which poll you look at, but it's something like 35 to 40 percent is what we have retained of the 2019. Vote. So you would regard that as catastrophic. It, I mean, obviously, it underlines the terror. It underlies the terrible poll ratings. And what I hear, I spend a lot of time going around the country talking to conservatives. Uh, they say they are uncomfortable committing to coming out and vote for the Conservative Party because they don't regard it as doing particularly conservative things. And I have to say I rather agree with them. So right at the moment, um, you say, I think publicly, what an awful lot of Conservatives would say privately, you are hurtling to defeat. Well, you only have to look at the polls. Obviously, we're hurtling to defeat. We're, we're hurtling towards a terrible defeat. And uh, every poll one looks at says the same thing. We're, we're going to lose, and we're going to lose bad. And the only debate is, is how bad. Mm -hmm. So we have to do something to change the story and bring our voters back. And at the moment, we're not doing that. So let me ask the question absolutely directly. Do you think that Rishi Sunak is the right person to be leading the Conservative Party at the moment? So I believe uh, Rishi Sunak can still turn the Conservative Party into a, the kind of Conservative Party that I uh, would like to see. I believe he would like to, uh, you know, he would like, he stands for a lot of those things himself. But he has the problem that the party is a very broad church. He's chosen to tilt to the left of the party and base his support on a wing of the party that is a bit less comfortable with all of these things. And that's how we've got into this position. And I think the right thing for him to do is, you know, even at this late stage, look at the policy offer, make sure we're offering things that deal with the real problems of the country and try and bring back some of those who represent that view within the party. Now, I know that he's trying to work out how to win over, as it were, your wing of the party as well at the moment, and I hear that he is now talking to Boris Johnson and wants him back on the campaign trail. How much of a difference does that make to your prospects? Well, let's see. I don't know what conversations there have been or Sorry, what if he came been back, about. I mean, if uh, let's see if he came back. I mean, but Boris is a great campaigner. Uh, you know, people like meeting him, they like talking to him, and when I go out there, people still say, you know, why did you get rid of Boris? We liked Boris. You know, that is a different question from do people think the Conservative Party has the right policy offer for the challenges of the next few years? And I think Boris returning might help 
the presentation, I don't think it necessarily changes yeah. the substance of the offer. And, and the overall result, perhaps. Um, so when you say you would like him to be more conservative, just give me some examples of what... I mean, there's been a, it was raised in the Prime Minister's question today that Britain should leave the ECHR, mm. uh, which a lot of people on your side of the party think as well. And uh, I know that the Prime Minister was given the suggestion, in fact, I think by Lee Anderson, that um, he should have a referendum on this on the same day as the election, thereby persuading lots of conservative-minded people to come to, to vote in the mm. referendum and vote in the election as well, but that he turned that down. Is that the kind of thing that you're talking about? I mean, that's one of the things. Um, I'm, I don't know about the referendum plan particularly, but I, I, I must say... You know, I, I slightly reluctantly at first come to the conclusion that we are going to have to leave the ECHR. I thought a few years back we could perhaps avoid it uh, because it is a big reputational treaty, obviously. Mm. But but I've come to the conclusion that we are never going to get back control of our borders or be able to do the things we need to within the country unless we uh, we we come out. So I think it's it's probably got to happen. What about the idea of paying people 3,000 quid or whatever to go to Rwanda, people who, whose asylum claims have failed um, but can't be sent back to their own countries? Do you like that idea? I mean, the problem with that idea is it, it rather gives the impression that the main idea isn't going to work. Uh, mm. And it's a way of getting people onto a plane and out of the country. Paying I mean, them to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea in principle. But but if you are trying to create a genuine deterrent effect for people to come here in the first place, it doesn't seem like the best way of going about that, I would say. Um, let's turn to the economics. We've had um, the autumn statement and then the budget. And in both, we saw a 2% cut in, 2p cut in uh, national insurance contributions. That's cost a lot of money for the Treasury. And so far, the net effect on the opinion polls has been absolutely zip. Hmm. Now, are you one of those who thinks that before the election, it's very important for the Chancellor to actually cut income tax? So what I think is that... Um, there's no future for this country as a high-tax, high-spend, social democrat-type economy. We've got to move away from that. We do have to get the tax burden down. The problem that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have is that they've spent 18 months showing they've been rather reluctant to reduce taxes, talking about stability, talk, you know, we're referring stability back to... Stability does the matter. I mean, it does no. matter, mm. it does matter, but also having a growing economy matters, and mm. that's where they've chosen to, uh, to put the emphasis. So so you can't suddenly pluck a tax cut out of the air, change your agenda and expect people suddenly to say, that's fantastic, it's right after all. You've got to have a story and an explanation behind it. With the greatest respect, I'm slightly going to come off it mode. You know perfectly well they're not going to change direction really now in the election. You know that Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak are not going to come to your wing of the party and change direction. So what is the game? I mean, are you really expecting a change of leadership immediately after the election or perhaps before that will in your view, rescue conservatism in this party? Well, uh, the leadership is for MPs. I'm not an MP. I don't know what's going on amongst... Um, the, I don't know the, what's the, going the commons, on. Come on, yes, you do a commons. bit. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's not for me to comment on that. You know, I, I um, came into the Lords, thanks to Boris. I have... Um, since then campaigned consistently for uh, a version of conservatism that is about low tax, low spend, low immigration, dealing with the problems the country's got, housing, the NHS, the net zero policy, all that. And, and I've argued that very consistently. And what, what I want is a Conservative Party that can deliver those things. And you prefer that to a Reform UK party. I know lots of people say, oh, you must be backing reform, but you're not backing reform. Nonetheless, they're coming up in the polls all the time at the moment. And if you get to the point where the Conservatives and reform are within sort of finger-touching distance, that is pretty much curtains for the Conservative Party, isn't it? Well, I don't know about curtains, and it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but, but obviously, you know, it could happen. I'm a little sceptical, I must admit. When I look at the, um, the by-elections, the Wellingborough by-election, for example, 25,000 ex-Tory voters stayed at home. Only 4,000 came out to vote for reform. And I still think there's a, um, a reluctance among Conservatives, because they can see that the Conservative Party is the potential government of the country and has a philosophy that goes with that, and reform is not quite there yet. And, and so I, that's why I say the right thing is to get this very successful party that's governed the country off and on for the best part of the last 200 years into the right place again. 
a very, very grim way for the grim day for the Tories, but there is a way back. Absolutely, there really is, and it's not too late. Okay, Lord Frost, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Now, I want to know what you've made of Rishi Sunak and the government's response so far to the Hester Row, and what did you make of the Speaker's decision today not to allow Diane Abbott to speak in the Commons? Text me on 84850 or email me on mar at lbc.com. And now to the SNP, whose leader in Westminster, Stephen Flynn, was in the studio just moments ago, and we began our conversation by asking him what he made of the Prime Minister's performance in the Commons today. It was weak and it was typical of a Prime Minister who's completely out of touch with with public opinion and the reality, the gravity of the, the situation that he faces. Look, the comments were, as I said today, they were racist, they were odious and, and they were deeply dangerous. A Prime Minister for all peoples should have came out and said immediately that this is wrong. And maybe not that that money should go back to the guy, actually, but why don't send it to an anti-racism charity? And of course, it wasn't just the, the the racist aspect of this, it's the very threatening aspect of this. To say that a member of parliament should be shot is extremely severe. And the prime minister seems to think it's OK for Mr Hester to say, I'm sorry, that was rude, I shouldn't have said that. That's not good enough, it doesn't cut it. It's a bit more than rude. It was a uh, lot more than rude. Absolutely. It was really interesting, you know, looking at the overall reaction, that the Conservatives um, spent an entire day unable to use the word racist. Finally, um, after Kemi Badnock had said it, the Prime Minister said it. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And you know, even when the Prime Minister stood up today, he caveated his response by saying, his first response to Keir Starmer by saying alleged. There's nothing alleged here. And this, as I understand it, happened. It needs to be called out. It needs to be condemned. But it's not just for me to do that or for Keir Starmer to do that and many others across the Parliament who have done that today. It should have been for Diane Abbott to be able to stand up and use her voice. And I was really was interested that. you raised that because I was watching from, from the gallery today and she was bobbing up, standing up again and again and again, looking at the speaker, expecting to be called, hoping to be called, and she wasn't called. Why do you think he didn't call her? I cannot fathom why the Speaker of the, the House of Commons did not allow Diane Abbott to use her own voice on a matter which is intrinsically linked to her uh, as, a, as a person. It was an absurd decision. Every single member of Parliament in the chamber knew that Diane Abbott, she was sitting up the back behind me, we all knew that she was bobbing, that she was ready to ask a question, that she had her notes with her. We were all just waiting for it to happen. And then the Speaker decided that, that she's not going to, to have a voice on, on this issue. And if I may, I think he's he's lost control of, of the chamber. Obviously, the 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 disagreement between myself and Lindsay is well known to everyone, but this was this was a stage furlough today. Are you suggesting you think he was cowed in some way, that he thought it would be too embarrassing for the government if she spoke? You, you know what, I think it's beyond even me to offer some sort of commentary as to the decision making that the Speaker gave today because it's so outrageously bad. I noticed you um, scooting up the steps at the end of the, the session to talk to Diane. What did she say to you and what did you say to her? I, 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 won't, I won't necessarily go into to specifics because it was very fleeting, but I just wanted to express to her my shock that she yeah. hadn't been taken. Um, I expected her to be able to use her voice today. Everyone knew that she was ready to do that and it's just very disappointing, but maybe typical of Westminster that that Diane Abbott wasn't able to express her own views on a matter that is obviously so mm. pertinent to her as an individual. As you perfectly fairly raised yourself, you've had quite a feud with the Speaker over the way he treated a particular vote. Do you now think he has to go? Yeah, I mean, of course he does. Um, he, he broke precedent when it was um, to do with us. He changed the rules on following a private discussion he'd had with Keir Starmer. I've got very strong views as to what that discussion w would have been about, um, but we'll never we'll never obviously know. He, he cowed down to the Labour leader, but today was just a step too far. Um, you've got myself and others talking about Diane Abbott using the the time that we have to raise our concerns about the language that's been used, the threatening language towards one of our parliamentary colleagues, whether they're in our own political parties or not, she should have been afforded that right as well. It's, it's unforgivable that didn't happen. You're not, I think it's safe to say, a natural ally of the Scottish Conservatives. Mm -hmm. But they said today they would not have taken money from Mr Hester and urged the UK Conservatives to think harder of what they've done. So... Presumably you would applaud that. I, I mean, even, yeah, absolutely. I, don't, I wasn't aware of that, but I guess even a, a broken clock is, is right every every now and then. And that's, 
that, that's maybe reflective of the fact that sometimes the, the Conservative Party in Scotland are quite different to the Conservative Party um, in London, but of course it's, it's London and, and their views that matter, especially Sunak's views that, that matter. He's shown himself to be completely out of touch, to be very, very weak. Um, again, and this, this entire situation is, is just appalling. It shouldn't be happening in this day and age. Everybody behind the scenes is talking about when the election's going to be. What's your own view? Do you think we are hurtling towards an earlier one than we thought? <laughs> My own view is uh, changing uh, on, on an almost daily basis. <laughs> um, I, I, we badly need uh, an, an election. This isn't sustainable. It's it's chaos after chaos. It's it's a government which doesn't know what it's doing. The, the agenda in Westminster is almost non-existent. It's fighting internal battles at the expense of time which should be dealt dealing with the cost of living crisis, dealing with the fact that people are really struggling at this moment in time, dealing with the fact that austerity is coming down the line, that there's going to be £18 billion pounds of cuts to public sector baked in. We're not discussing these things because this government is on its knees. It's finished. We need to have a general election. The public need to have their say. Uh, and of course, to, to viewers in Scotland, they should vote SNP. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the party political broadcast. <laughs> so inevitably, inevitable from the leader of the SNP at Westminster, Stephen Flynn. Thanks very much indeed for coming in.